so you can find more about myself on the staff page at LSE, but I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I uh, did some physics, electronics, and then f since 2003 I've been reading and studying social science. And <coughs> I haven't given up on the technical and mathematical stuff, so I'm also interested in the mathematics of the blockchain. Um, and uh, so I'm somehow able to do both aspects of the research, and which is uh, quite interesting. Um, so what I thought I would do today is uh, give you a, a few more um, analytical tools to understand money in about three slides, after which I, c I was going to comment on the discussions and your presentations. I have my notes here. And then if you want, I can give you some more uh, ideas and updates on my current work. Now, Davey told me that I don't, need, I don't have that much time, so you tell me when to stop, okay? I'll just keep going. <coughs> okay, so there are different types of monetary theory, and uh, one of the problems or one of the needs for me to tell you these things now is that uh, monetary theory f uh, fell uh, a victim of the meta methadon strike, uh, which is essentially the uh, uh, gap that opened up between sociology and economics about 100, 150 years ago. The sociologists thought money was quantitative, therefore the purview of economists. Uh, the economists thought it was a transparent, neutral uh, medium. What really mattered was the real economy. So they, they didn't pay any attention to it, and so money fell through the cracks. Of course, Marx studied it, Symbol studied it, uh, Keynes studied it extensively, uh, Schumpeter studied it. So there are, there are quite a few sociologists and economists who have uh, studied money, but uh, no agreement in sight. Therefore, today there are still three or four different main strands of monetary theory. The most convincing, I think, is sociological monetary theory. However, there are, uh, they, uh, we should think of them as working together. So how do we think of this? So money is a social relation of credit and debt, which is formalized through the double entry bookkeeping method. And why is it social? Because it's based on trust. So it's <coughs> Uh, based on some form of backing, so it's both trust and confidence that the backing is there. Uh, morality, uh, so you have to repay your debts. And power, so the rate of interest of the loan is proportional to the power differential. <coughs> so interestingly, money has a life cycle, so most neoclassical economists would disagree with that. Okay? But we can say that money is created, it is spent one or more times, and then, and then it is destroyed when a loan is repaid to the bank or when taxes are paid. And I can actually give more tangible examples of how that works uh, mathematically and intuitively, and you know, I'm sure you will understand it by the time I'm done. Um, anyway, the number of times it is spent between its creation and its destruction is called the velocity. So the velocity of the euro is about 1.5. The velocity of Sardex is about 12. There are interesting reasons for that. In other words, you may have heard of this idea that complementary currencies stimulate the local economy. They certainly do. They get spent a lot more before they're destroyed. <coughs> okay. Um, so, so money is debt. However, since it is assignable debt, after it is spent a few times, the manner in which it was created is, is forgotten. And its perception is a precious commodity predominates. So again, you have the objectivity and quantification aspect, and then you have sort of subje subjective perception of what money is. You have cultural baggage of gold and precious commodities as being used as money. So all of that is, makes this field very difficult to unravel. <coughs> now, the creation and destruction is best understood through the sociological theory, whereas the way it is spent, I think the commodity theory works pretty well. So if you, are un, un, if you are unaware of the fact that it's created and destroyed and you just focus on how it is spent, then you say, what's the problem? You know, commodity theory works really well. Leave me alone. Okay, that's what economists usually say. Okay. <coughs> so from the sociological perspective, all money is debt. How, however, not all debt is money. This is what jo jo Geoffrey Ingham says, uh, so, uh, economic sociologist at Cambridge, is a wonderful guy. So therefore, debt is the more general concept. Okay, I think this is an extremely important idea. 
So a loan can consist of money that already exists or of money that is created at the moment the loan is made. Collateral guarantees that if a loan is not repaid, the value of the loan is not lost. Okay, we all know this. When money was created as part of the loan, as banks do, the collateral is called backing. Okay, so this is just basic vocabulary. So some examples, uh, which are oversimplified, and each of these is probably arguable, but let's just go for it for sake of time and simplicity. So when the state prints money, then the backing is future tax receipts. An example of when that did not work is Argentina in 2001. Uh, the foreign markets lost the confidence that the Argentinian government was going to be able to, uh, 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 let's say, collect taxes, and therefore the peso just, uh, well, they, they, it was pegged to the dollar at the time. So anyway, the whole thing collapsed because of this backing. This perception of the backing uh, fell through the cracks. What's the positive entry in their bookkeeping method? It's, it's the state supplier's bank balance. In other words, the, the state has paid somebody, okay, created money in the process. The supplier has a positive amount. The negative entry is the public debt. Okay, created some money, and you keep track of it with the double entry bookkeeping accounting system, uh, so that so you have to keep track of the negative uh, part. When <coughs> when banks issue money. They, um, as explained by Douthwaite, who's just a sort of the saint patron of this place, right? Uh, the, uh, the backing is the value of the house. The positive entry is the house seller's bank balance, and the negative entry is the buyer's mortgage loan, uh, although the bank records it as an asset because they were going to get that plus interest. Uh, your visa bill, and I owe this to Chris Cook, uh, uh, basically, the backing there is your credit line, your job, credit history, and so forth. The positive entry is the retailer's bank balance, and the negative entry is your credit card bill. In the case of mutual credit, um, <coughs> you have uh, the ability, uh, based on trust, for a company to go in the red. They need to buy something from another company, which is a member of the same circuit. They don't have the euros or the pounds to do it, so they uh, go in the red of so many credits, where one Credit is equal to one euro in the case of Sarbet. The backing is the products and services that that company will sell over the next 12 months. Okay? So that's actually the labor. This is ties in with labor theory of money nicely. Uh, the positive entry is the seller's credit balance, and the negative entry is the buyer's credit balance. So you buy, so they start at zero, the buyer's goes down by 100, the seller's goes up by 100, you've created 100. The monetary mass has been incremented by 100. <coughs> okay, notice how in Bitcoin the backing is provided by the proof of work, so by the CPU cycles expended uh, to find the the private key, so by the energy expended, so in the case of non-renewable energy, by the carbon released to find that private key. So this is diametrically opposite to Douthwaite's idea of using the value we place in the environment as backing. Okay, so this is one reason why I don't like the Bitcoin. And I will say this also later, but Bitcoin and blockchain are not necessarily connected. They can be two different things. Two thing, they can be two different concepts. <coughs> okay, so, all right, so what I did is I took notes on most things that were said, and then I highlighted the ones that I thought were interesting for one reason or another. So starting with Joshua, um, I, I really like the fact that you talked about trust you talked about debt at the, the, at the pub, you know, when you, have a, on, when you put something on the tab. There is a trust relationship between you and the barman, although they do keep your credit card usually. <laughs> <laughs> but assuming they didn't. <laughs> uh, and I, I really like the tractor example. That's a scary example. And here I will cite uh, Polanyi as well in terms of fictitious commodities. So money, land, and labor, Polanyi said, are fictitious commodities. They really shouldn't be commodities. Uh, how can money be a commodity? Well, a commodity has a price. The price of money is its rate of interest. Okay? So 
If money is not a commodity, its rate of interest is zero. Um, <coughs> well, to those three, I, c I think in the modern era, we could, we could act, add also knowledge, so the digital knowledge and so forth. And therefore, uh, the fact that the software of the fractals is considered to be property of uh, you know, John Deere is, uh, is, it goes against uh, some of the, let's say, more socially important values and so forth. <coughs> and uh, I wonder, uh, you know Peter Drahos? I wonder what he thinks about that. Uh, he, he's written a lot about these kinds of things. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, so um, is trust a cost or a resource? Wonderful line. I like that. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Pader. Pader? Yeah. yeah Pader. Okay. Um, Pader. Your name. Pader. <laughs> so the disjuncture between the evidence, scientific evidence, and the paucity of the response was a very nice uh, way to put it. Um, and then you were talking about the urban mobile consumer society based on industrial scale production within a growth economy. And this reminded me of a conversation I had just this uh, past weekend with an economist from the European Investment Bank. I was at the Sardex annual event and there were some people, some investors and so forth, and the EIB was there because they're worried about the fact that this European Commission structural funds to various parts of Europe uh, somehow are sent but do not reach the ground. Now, quite aside from you know, corruption and you know, obvious ways in which the money can be diverted, it's also a matter of the fact that uh, people who have these large stashes of money who are responsible for administering them um, can use the f can use not spending it as a source of power and you know control just as much as spending it in illicit ways and so that's what hap tends to happen a lot that the money is sent back after a few years because you know so many billions were just not spent <coughs> but he was talking about something deeper he was saying that uh, the mm, essentially the way cities have been built and uh, w was optimized to create value in, uh, let's say, in a capitalist system and with you know, bank money creation mechanisms and so forth. Um, so, uh, and, and he's saying we're moving toward a different kind of economy which is based on, on uh, you know, it's a knowledge economy, it's all digital. Uh, the way we create value is different and, and uh, cities are going to collapse because the way they create value is not sustainable anymore. And that's why they're interested in Sardex and mutual credit, because they see that as an alternative to the, the normal uh, you know, way of doing things, which is based on capitalist money. <coughs> um, anyway, just to say that there is uh, a lot to think about there, because uh, we're moving towards some uh, interesting transitions, not necessarily. So this type of community will become increasingly important, where you, ha where, where you do have sustainability <coughs> and resilience. Graham, monetary system part of the ironcladding. Yes, I agree entirely, <laughs> especially when it's based on interest. Um, the purest form of money is mutual credit. I had heard that before, it's a nice thought. I'd <laughs> like to see whether that can be proven in some way. And then you, we're talking about that the back end is uh, trust, uh, but fine, but it's also, I would say, I would argue in more practical terms that it's the you know, trust is a proxy for the products and services. So the back end, I think, is the confidence that this particular company that you allow to go in the red will be able to sell products and services over the next 12 months. So on that basis, the circuit of other companies is willing to extend a credit line to that company because they know that they are solvent, they work hard, they pay their taxes, you know, all these other indicators are, let's say, reassuring. <coughs> So these are, as you notice, those are somehow, you know, social, closer to social indicators. They're not, uh, you know, they made a lot of money last year. You know, it's <coughs> okay. Uh, Ronan, I liked everything you said pretty much. Where is Ronan? Ah, there you are. <laughs> um, <coughs> in particular, I, th I, th I thought well, this line was great. Embedding a currency into the life of a community is a long process. Absolutely, it, um, it took the Sardex people, uh, they started thinking about it in 2006. They founded the company at the end of 2009. The first um, 
member of the circuit was in 2010, and uh, he joined because he didn't know that he was the first. <laughs> <laughs> and then they've been growing fairly quickly since then. Uh, now they have 3,300 members, so it's 10 years later. And in 2015, the uh, transacted volume was 51 million euros, or credits. <coughs> but it took a long time. Uh, in your reflections, you said, is the blockchain really transformational? Okay, and I would agree with that uh, hesitation there because the technology by itself is not transformational, but it's, it's you know, the extent to which you can integrate it with other things, like some of the ideas around the, the tables that were being discussed. That can be transformational. Gar, uh, I really like the cost. Where is Gar? Still here? He left? Okay, anyway, the cost, I thought, was uh, a very good point. The minor farms, the environmental cost of that is, must be pretty significant. And then he was talking about, the, you know, best practices. You need to have lack of trust <laughs> in order to set up a blockchain. Okay, fine, but you can also uh, turn it around and say, you know, you, perhaps you, if you have need of governance, like some of the examples that were being discussed in the afternoon, you know, the blockchain can help some of the governance, governance and accountability aspects. And then, yes, somebody earlier this morning in the question and answer session was talking about the blockchain as, uh, and, and uh, as if it was the same thing as Bitcoin. Um, so, so Bitcoin is used, uh, or let's say is created, uh, as a way of quantifying the effort required to derive or to arrive at a private key, which is a very long, complex calculation. Uh, <coughs> um, if you don't need to have the privacy, okay, you can still have a blockchain, but uh, you don't have to spend all the CPU time. So you can, so you can think of the blockchain as a distributed ledger, and if it's not, you can do the hashing, which okay takes a few cycles, but not that ma not that many, um, and. Um, so from the point of view of an isolated, uh, let's say, optimization of certain internal processes, you can use a blockchain as another form of a database. Uh, and you don't need any bitcoins there. You don't need to worry about the money aspect. <coughs> if you do need some money aspect, then don't do bitcoin. It's just, you know, it's worse than commodity money. It's a stock. It's got the volatility of a stock. It's, it's like, it's worse than capitalist money, okay? So I would use neutral credit. And in fact, I, um, at Sardex, we're starting to think about how to combine these two, these two aspects, these two things. And there are some frameworks out there uh, that are very promising, like Open Transactions and Bill White's work on lightweight crypto ledgers um, that are <coughs> you know, potentially useful for these kinds of things. OK, so those are my comments. Would you like me to go on with more slides? Do we have time? How much? Five. Five minutes. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is what happens when you have commodity money. Everything gets financialized. This is a better architecture where you have a neutral credit system that mediates a non-capitalist market as long as the, all the balances uh, are at zero interest. And that barrier there works as long as you have non-convertibility. So for example, Brixton Pound does not have a real barrier because you, it's backed by sterling and you can convert, you can buy Brixton Pounds with sterling, okay? So with the Swiss beer and Sardex, uh, you cannot buy credits with the national currency. It's non-convertible. <coughs> um, this is inspired by Douthweight where you have different kinds of economy at different scales for different purposes. Uh, and the red line there is the, the red boundary is the non-convertibility. These slides are available, so I mean, you can read through them um, on your own time. Here is a summary of the reasons I think Sardex works with a few more. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll, I'll pause uh, on just two more slides. Uh, this, <coughs> this tries to capture the different ways you can think of the political and economic system. So you can have a capitalist or a common-based economy, or you can have a, 
state-centered or libertarian political system, and you get these different quadrants. So one could argue that Sardex falls in the bottom right, but that's not quite correct <coughs> because they have multiple uh, uh, circuits in different parts of Italy. It's not the same company. They work with other companies that run uh, different circuits built in the same way and using the same software infrastructure. And um, they are complementary to capitalism. Okay, so the idea here is that um, the power imbalance between uh, the banks and you know all the large industry and so forth, and for example the eco village is very significant. Yes, it's huge, right? So you cannot take this as a frontal assault. You know, if you, if you cannot you cannot somehow address the problem through uh, let's say a direct confrontational uh, strategy. I think it's better to think of an approach which is based on a cultural transformation. In other words. Uh, somehow virally uh, infiltrating the minds of people to explain to them that money is actually something you can design and that it has these properties and it can do you know, things that are good and things that are bad depending on the design. <coughs> and if people start understanding what money is and that it has these properties, that <laughs> then I think that they will hold the politicians more accountable and then you know, we, we will have a better chance at changing things. This the only problem is that it's going to take maybe 10, 20 years uh, if things uh, start falling apart. In other words, people will wake up and will look for solutions more quickly. And it may take 50 years if things don't fall apart. Mm -hmm. so just because just it's, a, as you can see, it's a complicated set of concepts. And then maybe some words about technology. We talked about technocentrism in different parts of the day. And um, so I like Feinberg. He's an academic grandson of uh, Heidegger, has an interesting view on technology. And so he, he says that you know, uh, Marx's determinism is uh, neutral and autonomous. Uh, then we have humanly controlled optimism, which an example of that would be the um, MIT perspective, the Media Lab perspective, where you have a lot of uh, techie kind of stuff, gadgets being created. And a lot of that is fun. Then there is the uh, more pessimistic view of uh, this, this Ludism would be probably bottom left here. Uh, technology is bad. And then critical theory tries to engage with technology in a more constructive way, recognizes the technology carries values but also uh, recognizes uh, human agency and our ability to create it through some sort of uh, more responsible engineering perspective. So there are some references and some good books. Thank you.